my heart to sing thy grace streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above praise thy mountain fixed upon it Mount of thy redeeming love Here I raise mine Ebenezer Hither by thy help I'm come And I hope by thy good pleasure Safely to arrive at home Jesus sought me when a stranger Wandering from the fold of God He to rescue me from danger Interposed His precious To grace how great a debtor Daily I'm constrained to be Let thy grace, Lord, like a fetter Bind my wandering heart to thee Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it Prone to leave the God I love Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Well, welcome to our worship service here at Harlandale Christian Church. Today we're wrapping up our message series, uh, A Declaration of Dependence. And we, we thank our God, our Heavenly Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for providing every blessing that we have, for bringing us together in fellowship and providing us salvation, forgiveness from our sins. We worship our God. We lift up his holy name. The psalmist says in Psalm 24, how great, how wonderful God is. But he says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it upon the seas and established it on the waters. Our great God has created everything, has created us, has breathed his breath of life into us and he gives us grace and mercy and forgiveness of sins we praise our god and our lord and savior jesus christ for that let's worship him in prayer father we thank you for every blessing that you provide to us we thank you for for your love your grace and your mercy and for knowing our needs even before we know, we know them. Knowing that we needed your salvation, your grace and mercy, even before we were born. Thank you for every blessing that you provide. And for Father, because of your blessing, because of your grace, your mercy, because of your love, we come together to worship you, to depend upon you for everything for every blessing of our lives. And we thank you. We praise you for that. Receive our worship, our adoration, and our thanks today as we lift up your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Blessed is sure. 
Jesus, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Saviour. my song, praising my Saviour all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above, echoes of mercy whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission all is at rest I in my Savior am happy and blessed Watching and waiting, looking above Filled with His goodness, lost in His love This is my story, this is my song Praising my Savior This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long.
Each Lord's Day as we gather at the 
communion table to partake of the Lord's Supper. We do this in remembrance of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. When he took, made that trek, that walk, carrying his own cross up to the hill of Golgotha, to Calvary, there to be pierced, broken, nailed, shed his blood for the remit for forgiveness of our sins, even so many years after. To take away the 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 blame, the guilt of sin for all who would believe in him and, and accept his grace, his mercy, as the price that was paid for our salvation. I'm reminded of the words that the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans chapter 7, verses 24 and 25. when he says, what a terrible failure I am. The King James Version says, what a wretched man I am. He says, who will save me from this sin that brings death to my body? In verse 25 he says, I give thanks to God who saves me. He saves me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Our hymn of communion today is, Thank you for saving me. And as we partake of this bread and this cup, this fruit of the vine, we do this in remembrance of his sacrifice, his gift of grace and mercy, so that Jesus' blood can save us, can wash away our sins, can pour the grace and mercy of our Heavenly Father upon us let's pray father thank you for saving us thank you for providing the the price to be paid your only begotten son to become the sacrificial lamb to take our sins upon his shoulders and go to the cross of calvary give his body, his flesh, his blood to provide your forgiveness, your remission of sin, your grace and mercy to all who accept your son as Lord, as Savior. Thank you for saving us, Father. We worship you. We love you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
There's a deadly disease that's running rampant in our society today. Every year, millions are infected and hundreds of thousands die from its deadly symptoms. I'm not talking about AIDS or West Nile virus or COVID-19. It's a disease that causes blood vessels to constrict and hearts to shut down. It results in the lining of the stomach being eaten away and causes intense pain in the brain. No, it's not anthrax. It's not some other chemical or biological weapon. It's the disease of stress and anxiety. A number of years ago, the Mayo Clinic claimed 80 to 85% of their total caseload was due directly to worry and anxiety. Many experts say that coping with stress is the number one health priority of our day. One leading physician has stated that in his opinion, 70% of all medical patients could cure themselves if they only got rid of their worries and fears. We know that medical science has, has closely tied worry to, to things like heart trouble, blood pressure problems, ulcers, thyroid malfunction, migraine headaches, and a host of stomach disorders, among other things. For example, 25 million Americans have high blood pressure due to stress and anxiety. One million more develop high blood pressure every single year. Eight million people have stomach ulcers, and every week, 112 million people take medication for stress-related symptoms. Clearly, we're a nation of worries, and it's literally killing us. With all of these stress-related disorders, can you imagine what a toll that it's taking on the healthcare industry and health insurance industry, and therefore, on our economy? This disease is literally destroying us. It's destroying us financially. It's destroying us physically. It's destroying us mentally and emotionally. And friends, it's destroying many people spiritually. That's why we so desperately need to hear and pay attention to Jesus' teaching found in today's passage in our series a declaration of dependence. Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 34. 
Jesus' message in this passage is, is this. Do not worry. He says in verse 25, I tell you, do not worry. Don't worry about your life and what you will eat or drink. And don't worry about your body and what you will wear. Isn't there more to life than eating? Aren't there more important things for the body than clothes? And then in verse 31, Jesus says, Don't worry. Don't say, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear? And in verse 34, So don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Three times in these three verses in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus gives us a simple command. Do not worry. Go back and find those three times and circle those words in your Bible or highlight them if you're using your Bible app and your phone or your your. Uh, uh, tablet do not worry and then I want you to look at and circle these three things that we are commanded to not worry about in verse 25 circle the words life and body then in verse 25 in verse 31 circle the words eat drink and wear and then finally in verse 34, circle the word tomorrow. What is tomorrow? It's the future. He's telling us not to worry about the future. Jesus tells us not to worry about our lives or our bodies or what we will eat or drink or wear. Or don't worry about the future. Basically, Jesus is telling us not to worry about anything. Why? Because worry doesn't work. And that's the fundamental problem with all of our worrying. Worry doesn't work. Look at Matthew 6, 27. Can you add even one hour to your life by worrying? Worry doesn't work. Will all of your worrying even add an hour to your life? Absolutely not. In fact, the opposite is true. Worrying will actually take away not only hours, but also years from your life. Worrying can make you sick. It can even kill you as we've already seen. So worrying doesn't work because instead of adding to your life, it subtracts. From your life. Not only can worrying kill you, but it also has the power to greatly hinder your life, to hold you back while you're still living. For example, it's said that during the, the building of the Golden Gate Bridge over San Francisco Bay, construction fell so badly behind schedule because several workers had accidentally fallen from the scaffolding and fell to their deaths. Engineers and administrators and managers just couldn't find a solution to the costly delays. Finally, someone suggested this gigantic net be hung, uh, be, be hung under the bridge so that it could catch anyone who might fall. Finally, in spite of the uh, enormous cost, the engineers opted for the net. After it was installed, Progress was hardly interrupted after that. A worker or two fell, but the net saved their lives. The net allowed them to, to move on in their work without fear and worry. Stress and worry are like debilitating diseases that leave you disabled, dysfunctional, just waiting to see what's happening. So again, worry doesn't work because instead of adding to your life, it subtracts from your life. Another problem with worry is that we often worry too much about the wrong things. It's said that 40% of all things that we worry about never come to pass. 30% of all of our worries involve 
past decisions that can't be changed. 12% focus on criticism from other people who spoke because they simply felt inferior. 10% are related to our health, which gets worse when we worry. And it's said that 8% of our worries could be described as legitimate causes for concern. 8%. Friends, that means that 92% of everything that we worry about is either out of our control, or it's in the past, or it's imagined. 92% of the things that we worry about are in reality unnecessary worries. We are literally wasting years of our lives worrying over things that will never happen. So once again, worry doesn't work. Worry doesn't work because instead of adding to your life, it subtracts from your life. Before we get into the main points of today's message, I want to share with you an illustration that Melvin Newland, former president of Dallas Christian College and, and longtime preacher, shared. It's an article written by an 85-year-old woman. Here's what she wrote. If you live to be 75 years old, you will live over 657,000 hours. If I had my life to live over, I would relax and ramble around and be sillier than I had been on this trip. I would take fewer things so seriously, and I would take more chances. I would take more trips, and I would climb more mountains and swim more rivers. I would eat more ice cream and fewer prunes. I would perhaps have some actual troubles, but I'm sure I would have fewer imaginary ones. You see... I'm one of those people who have lived sensibly and safely, hour after hour, day after day. Oh, I've had my moments, and if I had it all to do over again, I would have more of them. Just moments, one after another, instead of living so many years in a big chair, acting like all of those persons who never go anywhere without a thermometer, without a hot water bottle, a raincoat, or a parachute. If I had it to do over again, I would worry less, I would laugh more, and I would pick a whole lot more daisies. You know, to me that sounds like a good way to live, but is it practically possible in this life to live with less stress, with less worry? Yes, it is. And that's the truth of the passage that we have in the teaching of Jesus today in Matthew chapter 6. Why worry? Well, Jesus says that you can live a worry-resistant life if you will put a few simple principles into practice in your life. Here are Jesus' four principles for worry-resistant living. The first is, accept God's approval. Look at Matthew chapter 6 and verse 26. Look at the birds of the air. They don't plant or gather crops. They don't put away crops in storerooms. But your Father who is in heaven feeds them. Aren't you worth much more than they are? And then verse 28. Why do you worry about clothes? See how the wild flowers grow? They don't work or make clothing, but, but here's what I tell you. Not even Solomon in all his royal robes was dressed like one of those flowers. And if that is how God dresses the wild grass, won't he dress you even better? Your faith is so small. After all, the grass is here only today, tomorrow. It is thrown into the fire. Friends, in verse 26, I want you to circle the phrase, worth much more. You are much more valuable than some bird. You're certainly much more valuable than, than common prairie grass. 
And if God takes such good care of these relatively unimportant things, then how much more will he take good care of you who are so valuable to him? The problem is found in one sentence in verse 30. Your faith is so small. Now some translations have it very simple. You of little faith. And we don't have enough faith to accept God's appraisal and value of our lives. We have trouble believing that, that we are really that valuable to God. But we are. We find it difficult to accept God's appraisal of our value because so many people through, in our lives have devalued us. And we've come to think that they must be right. Maybe you've been told all your life that you aren't smart enough, you're not pretty enough, you aren't athletic enough, you name it. Maybe you've been told that you will never amount to much. But you need to stop accepting the appraisal of others. Stop believing the lie that you are worthless or good for nothing. The story is told that once at a horse auction in New Mexico, one rancher bragged to his buddies that he had gotten the full asking price of $2,500 for his two-year-old filly, selling her to some kid before the auction even started. Well, then the rancher got rather gloomy one hour later when that same kid ran that same filly through the same auction and sold her for $4,200. It was evident that the rancher had not recognized his horse's true worth. But let me tell you something. Jesus recognizes true worth. Friends, when Jesus looked at Mary Magdalene, he didn't see an adulteress, but he saw a human being capable of profound love. When Jesus looked at Peter, he didn't see just a fisherman, but he saw a leader with tremendous potential. When Jesus looked at people, he didn't see them as defined by their economic level or their job description, but he sees them something much, much different. How does he appraise our true worth? Look again at the words from the Old Testament, from 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 7. People judge others by what they look like, but God says, I judge people by what is in their hearts. Let's take note of Jesus' words found in John chapter 7 and verse 24. Stop judging by exter external standards and judge by true standards. What are true standards? Are the standards of others true standards? No. And thank goodness they're not. You don't have to live up to or down to the standards that others set for you. Are your standards the true standards? No, those are not either. We often misjudge ourselves just as badly as other people do. The May 17, 1987 edition of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution had the following story. A rock hound named Bob Cutshaw owns uh, a little roadside shop outside Andrews, North Carolina. Like many in the trade, he hunts for rocks and then sells them to collectors or jewelry makers. He knows enough about rocks to decide which ones to pick, which ones to pick up, and which ones to sell. But he's no expert. He leaves the appraising of his rocks to other people. As much as he enjoys the work, he doesn't always pay the bill. It doesn't always pay the bills. He occasionally moonlights cutting wood to help put bread on the table. While on a dig 20 years ago, Rob found a, a rock he described as pretty and big. He tried unsuccessfully to, 
to sell the rock. And according to the, the Constitution, he kept the rock under his bed or in his closet. He guessed that blue chunk would bring as much as about $500, but he would have taken less if something urgent came up like paying his power bill. That's how close Rob came to, to hawking for a, a few hundred dollars what turned out to be the, the largest, most valuable sapphire stone ever found. That blue rock that Rob had abandoned to the darkness of a closet two decades before, now known as the Star of David Sapphire, weighs nearly a pound and could easily sell for $2.75 million in 1987. You see, the, the paper said that Rob usually left the appraising of his rocks to the experts. And he should have stuck with that strategy. What he personally appraised at $500, the experts later appraised at $2.75 million. I would say his appraisal was way off the mark, wouldn't you? And because Rob mistakenly devalued that chunk of blue rock, he nearly sold himself short. But who is the expert appraiser of the value of human life? Not other people. Not me. Not another preacher. Not even you. But God. So please, friends, Accept his appraisal of your value this morning. Max Licato said, you are valuable because you exist. Not because of what you do or what you have done, but simply because you are. So why have I spent so much time this morning trying to help you to understand the value that God sees in you? Because accepting God's appraisal is absolutely foundational to worry-resistant living. Friends, if you have something that's of, of great value, you, you protect it. You take good care of it. Have you seen people who highly value their cars? They, they take excellent care of them. They're always washing and waxing them. They make sure that they change their oil regularly. Maybe for you, it's not your car. If your garden is important to you, you'll make sure that it's fertilized and well watered and weeded. If your lawn is important to you, you'll make sure that it's mowed and looking nice. The point is, whatever you value, you take care of. Whatever you value, you protect. Whatever you value, you look out for. Well, friends, God's the same way. He takes care of that which he values, and there is nothing that, he's, that he values more than you and me. If you accept God's appraisal, then you, are, you understand that you are very, very important to him. You understand that as his dear treasure, he will take care of you, and he will protect you. And the assurance that God will take care of you and fill, take care of your needs is the basis of worry-resistant living. Why worry when God sees you as much, much more valuable? If you know in the depths of your being that God will take care of you, you don't have anything to worry about. So friends, accept God's appraisal his valuation of you, and begin today to experience worry-resistant living. A second point, pursue God's purpose. Look at Matthew 6, verse 33. But put God's kingdom first. Do what he wants you to do. Then all those things will also be given to you. Again, other translations say, seek first his kingdom. 
pursue God's purpose. Notice again the illustrations that Jesus uses. And he, he speaks of the birds and the lilies. He says of the birds, do not sow. Uh, or he said that the birds do not sow or reap or store away in barns in verse 26. About the lilies, he said, they do not labor or spin in verse 28. They were not working on their own agenda. They were not pursuing their own dreams. The birds were simply doing what God created birds to do. And the lilies were doing what God created lilies to do. So friends, I would ask today, are you doing what God created you to do? Rick Warren wrote in The Purpose Driven Life, it's not about you. The purpose of your life is far greater than your own personal fulfillment, your peace of mind, or even your happiness. It's far greater than your family, your career, or even your wildest dreams or ambitions. If you want to know why you were placed on this planet, you must begin with God. You were born by His purpose and for His purpose. Warren goes on to say, knowing your purpose simplifies your life. It defines what you do and what you don't do. Without a clear purpose, you have no foundation on which you base decisions, allocate, allocate your time, and use your resources. And that causes stress, fatigue, and conflict. So friends, I'd ask you again, are you doing what God created you to do? Seeking God's kingdom or pursuing God's purpose is a vital part of worry-resistant living. If you were to take a tool and, and use it for something other than what it was designed for, what would happen? Imagine trying to use a jackhammer to drive a nail in the wall just so you can hang a picture on it. What would happen? Or imagine trying to, to saw through a board using the flat end of a screwdriver. What would happen? Well, that's a picture of what happens when you try to live a life that you weren't designed to live. It causes frustration, stress, worry, and anxiety. So seek God's kingdom and pursue God's purpose. Now let me assure you, that's not going to be easy. There will always be other things that will try to distract you from, from God's purpose. But there will be other opportunities or, or options that will look enticing to you. But the end result of pursuing those things will always be worry and stress, anxiety, and frustration. Which leads us to the third principle of Jesus' teaching. Consider God's care. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 32 and 33, we're, we're told people who are ungodly run after all those things. Your Father who is in heaven knows that you need them. But put God's kingdom first. Do what he wants you to do. Then all these things will also be given to you. Friends, if we pursue God's purpose, then he promises to care for our needs. All these things in this passage, all these things is a reference to, to our needs of our daily life. The things that are mentioned earlier so that, that so many people worry about. Things like food and drink and clothing. God is aware and God cares. He's aware of the needs that we have in this life. And he cares enough about us to make sure that those needs will be met. Notice a, another time, the, the illustration of the birds and the lilies that Jesus used. Jesus said that the birds don't plant or harvest. And yet he says 
the heavenly or your heavenly Father feeds them. I'd like for you to circle the word your. I think that's a very important word here. He doesn't say their heavenly Father. He says your heavenly Father feeds them. If he's not their father and yet he, he takes care of them, then how much more is he going to take care of you since he is your heavenly father? Then about the lilies, he says that they don't labor or spend making clothes for themselves. But Jesus says, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. That's how God clothes the grass of the field. If God will take care of birds and lilies and grass, he will certainly take care of you. You can count on it. Consider God's care. I think two important points need to be made here. First, this promise is a conditional promise. God doesn't promise to automatically take care of all of the needs of every person in the world. This promise is valid only if we meet the criteria. And that criteria are that we must live for God and make his kingdom our primary purpose. Seek first his kingdom. That means that if we aren't doing the previous point, pursuing God's purpose, then he's under no obligation to provide for our needs. The second point this promise is not to meet all of our needs and all of our wants and wishes. Let me say that again. This promise is not to meet all of our wants and our wishes. He doesn't guarantee that all of our dreams and desires will be fulfilled. Instead, he promises to provide what we need. There are lots of things in life that we really want but we don't really need. God does not promise to provide those things. So don't think of this as some magic formula to get a fancier car or a more luxurious house or a fatter wallet. Because if you do, I promise you'll be disappointed. The story is told of an elderly woman who lived next to an affirmed atheist in an older suburb. This, this woman received a meager Social Security survivor's benefit. Although her finances only afforded her not even the most basic meal plans, daily this woman would open her windows to give thanks and, and pray to God. Finally one day, the middle of the month came and she had not received her check. Instead of complaining, though, she opened her windows, fell on her knees, and began to thank God and pray. Now that neighbor was sitting on his porch and overheard her prayer. Lord, although I don't have any food in my home, I know you'll provide. And so the neighbor thought to himself, this is a great opportunity to prove to her that there is no God. So he went out, he went to the store, purchased a carload of groceries. When he got home, he placed them on her porch, rang her doorbell, and then ran, ran over and hid in the bushes so that he could spring his surprise on her. Slowly but finally, that elderly woman made her way to the door. She opened the door, saw, saw all the groceries, and she praised the Lord for it. And about that time, the neighbor jumped out from behind the bushes and he shouted, God is not real. I bought those groceries there. I put those groceries at your door. And to this, the old woman exclaimed, I knew my God would supply my needs, but I didn't know he would make the devil pay for them. Now, friends, God does work in mysterious and oftentimes humorous ways. If you'll begin to consider God's care for you, you'll begin to experience worry-resistant living. 
when you take into consideration the fact that God knows everything that you need and he promises to, to take care of these needs, if you pursue his purpose, then you'll no longer have anything to worry about. That's worry, resistant living. Our fourth principle that Jesus shows, trust God's timing. Look at verse 34. Jesus says, so don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Friends, here Jesus is basically saying that we need to, to take it one day at a time. Just live one day at a time and don't get ahead of yourselves. Elsewhere in Scripture, God promises that he will not allow us to be tempted beyond what we are able. There's something similar to that going on here. I don't believe that God will allow us to, to have more trouble in one day than we can handle in that day. He says that each day has enough trouble, not too much trouble. But if we get ahead of ourselves and we start worrying about all the potential troubles that we might face this week, this month, this year, we'll soon be overwhelmed. That's more trouble than we can handle all at once. We need to remember and trust God's timing. We need to believe that he will time our troubles in such a way that we will be able to cope with them. Notice again the illustration of the birds. Jesus says that they don't store away food in barns. In other words, they don't go out and gather up a bunch of food and store it in a tree someplace to last them through the winter. They just go out every day and find enough worms or berries or seeds to get them through the day. And then they do the same thing the next day. They're living one day at a time. One day a wealthy businessman was disturbed to find a fisherman sitting lazily beside his boat. Why aren't you out there fishing, he asked. Because I've caught enough fish for today, said the fisherman. Why don't you catch more fish than you need, the rich man asked. What would I do with them? You could earn more money, came the impatient reply. You could sell them. What do I need more money for? asked the fisherman. You could buy a better boat so you could go deeper and catch more fish. You could buy nylon nets, catch even more fish, and make more money. Soon you'd have a fleet of boats and be rich like me. The fisherman asked, then what would I do? Then you could sit down and enjoy life, said the rich man. The fisherman asked, what do you think I'm doing right now? This simple fisherman had mastered the secret of worry-resistant living. He knew that he didn't need to worry about catching more fish. He, he, he didn't need to worry about making more money or worry about buying a bigger boat in order to enjoy life. All he had to do was take one day at a time. Friends, if you begin to do that too, you too will begin to experience worry resistant living so there we have Jesus four principles for worry resistant living in response to the question why worry accept God's app appraisal pursue God's purpose consider God's care trust God's timing here we have the secret to worry-resistant living and the conclusion to our series, a declaration of dependence. Everything that we've been talking about today could be summarized as you and me depending upon God to meet our needs. If we're depending upon God to meet our needs, we have nothing to worry about. If we're depending upon ourselves, then we have everything to worry about. Will you make a declaration of dependence upon God this morning? Will you bring your burdens and your worries and your concerns to him today? He invites you to do so. Can you hear him? 
He is saying in, in Matthew 11, verse 28, Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Friends, our song of decision and dedication today is an old favorite hymn, Trust and Obey. That's what it's all about. This declaration of dependence is trust and obey our God and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Will you do that today? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the words that your, your son, Jesus, our Lord and Savior, taught in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6. Thank you for the, the solution to worry-resistant living, to depend upon you, to depend upon your Son and your Spirit. Help us, Father, to depend upon you and not upon ourselves. Help us to trust and obey you and know that you will meet our needs. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.